on civil liberties. So this is a talk called the PCLOB, thank you, degrades the US Constitution. So let me give you a bit of background before I get into what the PCLOB is. So you've probably heard of the NSA. So the NSA has been gathering all kinds of data and uh, doing a lot of things that are pretty sketchy um, with regards, uh, even when you look at them in the framework of American law. Um, in particular, there's a piece of the American law, which is the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution, um, which is um, uh, which is not too bad. Um, it's quite good, actually. It says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So, for instance, this doesn't seem like it would cover tapping an undersea cable and recording, uh, you know, processing all of the data that runs along it. So um, when news came out last year that the NSA was doing this, um, uh, people were rightly concerned and raised some questions about it within the US. And President Obama even finally had to acknowledge that, gee, maybe we should think about scaling this back or something. So uh, you know, as governments do, he appointed a commission. So there would be a committee to study it. Um, and that commission was called the um, PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. So I'll just uh, show you their, their website there. It's a bunch of folks in a big conference room, and you can see our, our president uh, there at the end. So they were asked to look at all of the, um, all of the uh, data being taken up by the NSA, in particular under uh, the FISA Amendments Act. So FISA is the Foreign Intelligence Service Act. And it was a set of rules that were interpreted by the NSA to mean basically we can scoop up any data anywhere as long as we think that it will help us to, um, to gather foreign intelligence information um, is the way that they interpreted it. Um, and basically what, that, what they took that to mean was we can just pick up pretty much anything that we want. Um, and so the PCLOB was looking at this um, and they, and they ended up writing, as committees do, a rather large report. So um, the report, unfortunately, basically said, yeah, they do this. It doesn't seem like it's great. There's a few things we should change, but in general, OK. Um, so it's a bit of a disappointment for those of us who care about civil liberties to find that one of the you know, relatively powerful positions within the US government was, oh, sorry, was basically saying um, kind, of a, kind of a shrug. There were some minor recommendations that they made about how things should be changed, but there was no general assertion that this is a violation of the US Constitution. So I thought, let me, let me read. I, I thought I'd go and take a look at the report to see what was up with it. And I suspect I don't need to argue particularly strongly with folks here who care about our users' freedoms um, that more needs to be done than just a few minor reforms. But I wanted to show you a specific way that, I, that we can very clearly document about how the, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board degrades the US Constitution, because I think you would appreciate this. And maybe there's a few audiences that can only get this. So I went and I looked at the report, and there's the report there. And my first thought was, that thing in the background, that's a, that looks like a scan of the US Constitution, and it's, but it's pretty, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty faded. You know, it's not just faded, but it's kind of blurry. So what's up with that? So I thought, I thought, oh, let me um, let me take a look at that. Um, we're going to open it up in Inkscape. Uh, yeah, the first page looks good. Come on, Inkscape. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to ungroup, ungroup, ungroup. Oh, there it is. Let me try that again. Ungroup, ungroup, object, mask, release. <sighs> Clip, release. Uh, come on. Ah. Uh, Thank you very much, Dave. Failure. Sorry. Next up is Oliver Probst, who's going to be talking to us about Firefox OS.
Your time is going to start. All oh, right. I will hire it. Those people who didn't put them on, who didn't send me the PDF, get to set up during the time. Come up and find me afterwards. Hello. So, my name is uh, Oliver and I come from Sweden. I am not a uh, Mozilla employee, but uh, individual contributor and a Mozilla rep. Uh, we don't really have time to dig into what that are, but I guess you can use Google or a search engine, another search engine to find it out. Um, well, I'm here to talk about Firefox OS and it starts. It's about time we start talking about it. So, what is this Firefox OS? It's a new mobile operating system from Mozilla, the foundation and non-for-profit that uh, cares about uh, free and uh, open internet. Mozilla are, among other things, doing the Firefox web browser or as uh, many of you in this room known as Ice Weasel. Uh, but this is about Firefox OS. So uh, we had uh, these things uh, once upon a time called cell phones, little things you could uh, make a call, send text messages, play some simple games. 2007 came and the uh, iPhone was released internet became actually usable on a mobile phone and it's kind of ironic that uh, actually um, initially Steve Jobs uh, stated that uh, uh, developers would only have access to internet uh, and like Apple would own, be the only uh, part who would uh, be able to use native APIs but yeah that didn't happen uh, and SDK was introduced. Uh, well, time moved by, more vendors decided to create mobile operating systems or smartphones operating systems or I guess I would say rather they create uh, different ecosystems where basically they in one way or another locks in the users by using uh, native APIs or uh, exclusive services. So, well, with Mozilla trying to change that status quo basically with Firefox OS. And it's a bit different. Uh, here's some technical foundation thing. And uh, what's really interesting is that uh, everything you see on a Firefox OS device is uh, actually written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And to create a rich, uh, sorry, a rich user experience, there is some APIs available. There are also some developer resources available, like uh, an emulator and uh, stand uh, that you can use either in the browser or as a standalone client. A marketplace where you can publish your app and you and users can get paid. Some more resources also exist so if you want to dig into some more details. There is devices available on the market so and it's uh, increasing increasing recently a device was launched in India for 33rd or 33 dollars device quite exciting. More devices are coming. Tablet, vendors are adapting to tablets. It's open source. It's uh, all the source code is available on GitHub where you can fork it and send patches, contribute if you want. Some more links. Yeah, we don't have time for questions. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Oliver. Yeah, uh, if you have some, sorry. If you uh, your, have some time's more, your time's up. Your time's up. If you have some questions, you can ask me later. You don't have slides, right? Okay, next up, Sir Ram, Ram Krishna, who's going to talk to us about meetup.com. How you guys doing? I have no slides, so I can keep going. So, um, my name is Sri Ram Krishna. I am a director of the Gnome Foundation and also a member of the engagement team. So, um, the reason I'm here talking here today is about engagement. And one of the things I, I found about our community is we're, we're really insular people. We, we don't, we, we, we hang out at free software conferences, things like that, but do we really reach out? What is our users doing? And I really want, this was an experiment. I want to know what are they using their computers for? What are people doing in terms of startups? What are they, what are they doing? What, what, what are their plans? So I started going out to, to meetups so through meetups.com and going, okay, what's going on? And not only do I get to get free beer or, or whatnot, I get, I get to drink because that's the best part. Um, but also engage in conversations with people uh, about, uh, about what they do. And one thing I found is that when I'm talking, I, I, I found that the language I use changes. And I, I, I actually talk about GNOME as a charity, not as, as a nonprofit or, you know, you know why? Because those words actually mean a connection, connection for community. And so it's not that I'm selling GNOME or I'm selling Debian or I'm selling a this or our experience, I'm selling a community. That's what I found out. That's, that's what really connects people. So when I go out here and I'm engaging non-technical people, they really connect. They're like, wow, we're talking about people. And not, it's not just that we're, we're talking about people. I'm telling, I'm telling them we have mountains, mountains to climb, mountains, problems to solve. And that actually works. I, when, when I come back, I get a bunch of connections on LinkedIn. So every time I go in, I get two, three people who want to connect to me on LinkedIn. And what I think is this is a great experiment because we will be able to build communities this way. I think it's a really interesting way of building uh, and connecting with people and kind of build that environment and connecting with people that are not technical, and the other cool thing I found is that I actually have to talk to people in this non-technical jargon, right? We all have all have our ways to to talk about the various things. We all have our abbreviations. We all have our cultural um, um, mechanisms that we talk about. But when you're talking about someone who knows nothing about free software or nothing about computers, even you have to speak in terms of what they do. So those are one of the things in there. Um, actually, since I got two minutes, questions? <laughs> what? Come on, time's ticking. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> when you say uh, going to meetups, do you mean like, uh, are these meetups, do they have anything to do with technology? Are they like... People who speak. Yeah, they're, they're meetups like startups. Like, uh, so through meetup.com, they actually have like a startup happy hour. Uh, and I actually go out and meet people that way. And, and it's, a, it's actually quite fun to, to talk about it. So you're like taking people who are trying to work on their startup and make millions of dollars for themselves and distracting them by sucking them into Gnome? That sounds amazing if that's what you're doing. <laughs> of course I'm trying to suck them into Well, I don't actually suck them into Gnome. I just talk about cool things, and, and just happens that I talk about Gnome. You know. <laughs> One minute, let's go! <laughs> hey, I have a user group in a week and a half. Would you like to speak at it? Yes, I would love to speak at it. Yay! <laughs> next. Yes. Where in the world are you based? I am based in Portland, Oregon. This is my city. Hey. Hands up for that. All right, that's all. I think I got all, that's all the time I got, right? All right, next one. Let's go. Thank you very much. Next up is Aaron Wolf. Oh, how do I go to my? You do that. Slides. I don't. What? How do I? What? There you go. 
Where, where's my slides? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was in violation of the code of conduct. My fault. I didn't do it. So I'm going to start. I'll go ahead and. I'll, uh, oh, microphone's over here. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, grab a couple extra seconds. I'm one of the. Uh, not, okay, I'm one of the not so technical. I still identify as one of the not so technical people that Suram was just talking about, uh, and I'm also, uh, as of a couple weeks ago, local to Portland. But at any rate, I got involved in this community as a non-technical user. But over time, I'm getting more and more technical because now I'm involved in the community and I'm here at DevConf. And what got me involved was. Basically, I really find a lot of the proprietary stuff obnoxious. I don't like all the ads and the surveillance and the restrictions, and that stuff is, who would like that? I don't know anybody who likes that. But somehow, the products that put that stuff in are the ones that get everybody's money. And so we pay as a community for the products, not us as Debian community, but most people, pay for the products that do things nobody likes. And when the products come out that are free software and do things that are respectful to the users, they tend not to pay for it. OK, you put in a, some donations here and there, but what's the problem? The problem is something called the snowdrift dilemma, which is one of the game theory types of things talking about collective action problems. It works like this. What are you going to do when you want to see something succeed? Like you want your favorite free software project to be much better and get more people working on it, and you need resources, so maybe you'll put in your part. Well, you could get to work clearing the snow drift, so to speak, and if you do, and other people work with you, we cooperate, and that sounds nice. But you might say, well, I have a lot of other things to do, and you're sort of hesitant, and you see if somebody else is doing it. If they're getting it all done without you, you can do other things. So that might be your best selfish interest. Now, people who really like working on this stuff, they go and do it regardless. But what we get is what R.L. Balkan calls trickle-down technology, where we basically get what the developers want, and we don't necessarily get what's needed for the community. So if we are waiting for others, and the other people are waiting to see if we're going to do things. And think of outside of the Debian community, people who are the general public saying, yeah, I would like to use your free software if it was cleaner and easier to use and I didn't have to touch the command line and know all these technical things. But this other thing, even though it ad advertises at me and surveils me and does all this other crap, it, it works for me, so I'm going to keep using that and keep paying for that. And so we have this dilemma where we're seeing not as much progress as we need because everybody is saying, if everybody else went with me to support the free software and make it great, then I would use it with everyone else. But each person is saying that, and we're not getting the dilemma solved. We're not clearing the path. So to solve this, you have to do a couple things. One of them is an ongoing iterative situation helps people build a community and build trust. If I show you that I'm good for this and you know that I'm going to do my part, that helps. And we can have assurance contracts like Kickstarter that says, we are all going to work to make this happen, but nobody's going to be burdened unless we all together hit the goal. That's nice. Doesn't have the iterative part, though. And we need a culture where people really care about these things. So we're building that in a platform called snowdrift.coop, which is live online but not operating yet. You can pledge fake money. Uh, but our mechanism is a very simple way to try to move all of the funds that people give to all of the apps on proprietary app stores and all of the proprietary technology and even proprietary cultural works and move them to support free software and free culture. And I want to make a simple pledge. Each month, I will donate a penny for every 10 people who will pledge with me. So it's very simple. If more people pledge with me, I will, play, I will pay more because it is more worth it for me. And it is not worth it for me to pay $100 a month to something that I want to succeed if nobody else joins me because it won't change the world and it will make me poorer. And that's a big risk and it's not, I'm not going to do it. But if there were thousands of people joining me, I would put in all I could because we'd be changing the economy and making the world that I want to see. So it's a network effect. And there's a lot of other holistic things involved in making this work. Uh, we have a particular formula that involves tapering off if people who are richer decide to make larger pledges and still get some matching from the community. Uh, but we basically are running the whole thing as a community-built cooperative, three classes, a, the people working on the site, the people who are running projects, and the people who want to support projects. And we could use your help with any of those three things. Thank you. Thank you very much.
next up is uh, the delegate of Ashish Larioa talking <laughs> on. It says bits from Ashish. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeffrey Thomas. I'm not going to talk very much about Ashish uh, in this. I'm sorry. Uh, I, uh, but I will talk. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how I feel kind of like a heretic here, uh, in that I came here with three laptops, all of which run proprietary operating systems, and how that is, and I have some things I think about the community. And I want to say I value this community a lot. I love you guys. I don't think this is, I'm not saying that anyone did anything you know, wrong here, but I just want to think through some of what, how this appears to someone who is an outsider to the community. So you go and you register for DevConf, and you go to HTTPS colon slash slash dev. What's the cert there? It works pretty well for someone who's running Debian on their desktop, someone who's kind of already bought into the Debian community. Well, okay, it may or may not work pretty well. Uh, and you are running some other platform, and you've got to go through this process of figuring out the cert and you know, importing some CA, or maybe not even import, who is this person who's on a CA? And you think about that, and uh, you know, it feels like, you know, this, this is for, you know, this is for people who already have this working. This isn't for me. Uh, and then I go and I show up at a session and you guys are using Gobby. And Gobby feels like great software, but how do I get that working on Windows or a Mac? If I think there's a homebrew build, I don't know how well it works. I'm sure you can app get install it. Uh, I'm sure it works well that way. And what about... Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, what about the case where you know, I'm not using Debian? I think there are people who can contribute to Debian a lot who aren't running Debian, who aren't bought into Debian with all of their life. And I think we need to be courting those people and saying, here's how we get people involved. Here's how you can contribute to Debian, even if you're not running Debian on your desktop. I'll help you if you show up and you say, I've got a Mac and I want to use my Mac hardware. Our answer should be, you know, yeah, that's great. We want people using Debian, not go sell your Mac and find some different hardware. Uh, if we, uh, this is, again, just, I know there are great technical reasons for this, but I want to use my GPG key. That's a key I use for other things. And Debian says, use your primary key, interact with the web of trust in like ways that are somewhat ill-defined with uh, how my personal key signing policies work and how Debian wants me to work, whether Debian wants me to use expiration dates or not. Uh, I think we should build towards a world where you know, we say, yeah, if you want to be bought into Debian with your, you know, your evenings and your weekends and your daily life, your paid proprietary software developer, that's what I am. I write enterprise software for Windows by day. And I still contribute to Debian. And I think there are a lot of people that we risk losing because they'll go and say, I'm not really 100% bought in to this world. I'm not saying I can't swear off all of my free so all of my non-free software. I've got to write Mac software for work. That's what that's why how I get paid. That's how I live. And they're going to say I'm just going to use Homebrew. And is that really the best thing for free software? They're using something that isn't 100% committed. And you know, no offense to Homebrew as a project. It's a great project, but. We should be saying, yeah, sure, we'll help, we'll work with you. Uh, we understand that we don't agree 100% on goals, or we might not agree yet, but you know, Debian's about freedom of computing, and part of freedom is, I think, the freedom to be wrong, the freedom to make mistakes, the freedom to make wrong choices and not have people say, you're wrong, I don't want to work with you because you're wrong, you're using the wrong hardware, stop it, I'm not going to help you. Uh, it should be, you know, I think that, you know, there are things you can do. Uh, there are things you can do to help Debian, and I'm going to work with you as far as we agree. And we can build a community of all the people who are working on, uh, who are working on the Homebrew community, of all the Mac developers out there who are working together for a free software world. Is there a question? Yeah. Gobi is available for Macs and Windows. Sure. And there's a page on the Debian wiki on how to install okay. Debian on your Mac hardware if you want to. Uh, there is certainly a page on the Debian wiki on how to install it on the Mac hardware. I get the feeling if you go to IRC and you say, I've got a Mac, your answer is going to be, stop having a Mac. And I think that more important possibly than whether it works technically is whether we as a community think that it's okay for you to be doing. You will hear us stop uh, using a Mac, but you'll also hear, here's the wiki page where the instructions are. You'll hear different things. That you. speaks with different voices. Sure. So. And if you were on IRC and someone says, stop using that hardware, uh, we should say, no, don't do that. We can help you. 
Uh, I just want to say for all these people talking about Max, you should have this conversation more in depth with Paul Tag, who recently had this experience and failed. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ashish. <laughs> Next up is Marga, who's going to be talking to us about about the Debian Women Minicon. Yeah. So uh, last year in DevCon 13, we talked about this with a lot of people. A lot of people were uh, not sure that this would happen. Like the premise of the Mini DevCon was that we would have all speakers be women, and that we would have a technical and interesting mini devcon and a lot of people said yeah, are you sure you can do that is it really possible and yeah we thought we could do it we we thought we could manage to get two days filled with interesting talks uh, all given by women and we made it happen this happened earlier this year in march this is the group photo you can see a lot of people went And so I have a bit, some numbers on, on what happened. We had 16 talk slots, so eight talks each day. Uh, we had 14 speakers that we sponsored uh, coming into Barcelona from different parts of Europe or even from outside Europe. Uh, we have 19 videos available because some of the talk slots were divided into smaller talks. Uh, we had 160 attendees, so quite big for Mini DevConf. And almost approximately 35% of those attendees were women, which is like, I don't know if you know about the numbers of women in free software conferences or in free software in general, but 35% is incredible. At least for me, I, I didn't really expect to have this number of people. So as, as you see from these numbers, and you can see from the group photo, well, maybe you can, maybe you don't, but we didn't, we didn't have um, a restriction on who could attend. Everyone could attend, everyone was welcome. The only restriction was that the speakers should be women uh, or actually people that identify as women. Um, and uh, so uh, our goal with this was that we wanted to encourage women that hadn't given talks before to give talks and we also wanted to give role models for women that maybe wanted to give a talk, talk but didn't yet have the uh, necessary courage to do it and give visibility to the women that were already involved. I think we managed to accomplish all of those goals. I, th I think the conference was really, really great, and so we want to do it again next year. We have the possibility of doing it in Bucharest. It's not yet confirmed, but we want to do it. And we also don't have the dates yet. It's still in planning, but around May, June 2015, uh, we hope to be doing this in Bucharest. If uh, you know of a possible speaker that may need a little bit of encouragement to participate, please uh, get in contact with me. If you know of a possible sponsor that might be interested, because this is a different conference than DevConf and it gets different sponsors interested, please uh, contact me. And I guess that's it. I have time for questions, if there are any questions. Otherwise, more time for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Marga. Next up is Derek. He's going to be talking to us about DNS script. Your slides are the next just, one. Just press next. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Go. I'm Derek. Uh, so I, I'll pre face style. I actually use Debian on a day to day basis. I use Fedora. So most people probably don't know what DNS script is because it's actually not in the Debian packages repo, but I might change Yet. that. Yet. Yet. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's dnscript.org. Uh, it was created or backed by OpenDNS, I believe. That's designed to run a local resolver on your system that you talk to an, over an encrypted connection to some other first level resolver, and you run all your DNS queries through that. It uses NACL and Libsodium, and it's only the last mile of your DNS, so from you to your first level resolver, so don't expect it to save you past that level. Um, so DNSSEC has different goals, so don't get that confused. You, DNSSEC is used to verify the domain and the chain of trust for the domain. It doesn't hurt to use both. Uh, 
If you want to add a DNS crypt support for your resolver, there's a program called DNS crypt wrapper. It's on GitHub, and if you do that, you should add your server into the CSV file for the DNS crypt proxy project that's also on GitHub. What's missing? No package in Debian. Uh, it also doesn't support more than one resolver, so if you want to get around that, you need to run two DNS crypt proxy instances and then have two of those as your two name servers in your resolve.com. I actually ran into this because I'm running it on OpenWRT at home, and when the DNS server fails at 3 in the morning and someone's using the internet in my apartment, they come and wake me up, which really sucks. Um, <laughs> What's not missing, so there is OpenWRT support, which is really nice. Uh, there is Windows support if anyone just wants to run a GUI. I believe there's a GUI for it. And there's a number of resolvers. A lot of them are OpenNIC, so if you're not familiar with OpenNIC, it's like an ICANN alternative in some sense, which is kind of cool. And there's some other ones that are just other people running it, and it doesn't hurt to add more. And I, I guess that's it. I can answer any questions about it, but I, I'm not affiliated with the project. I just use it, so. Ian. So why would I use this rather than doing what I do at the moment, which is run a VPN from my laptop back to my full service resolver? That could work. Like, I don't see, it's kind of designed in the sense that, in, in my scenario, right, at home, I don't want to put this on all my servers or my desktops or people's phones or laptops when they come over. I'm running it at my router and DHCP gives them my router's IP for DNS and then transparently once it leaves my network is encrypted to the first level resolver. So if you're if you VPN and you route fifty three over to your first level resolver, that's you know the DNS or your VPN essentially the same thing. I don't see why there's an advantage to either in that scenario. Okay. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> Conveniently, I'm up next. So I'm going to be talking to you about uh, configuration management by botnet. You all know configuration management and uh, system automation tools. We've been having our cheese and wine party at one of the companies that are involved with them, for instance. My problem with all of these tools is that they do the entire stack. There's a communications layer, they do PKI, they do inventory management, remote execution, policy enforcement, everything, all in one. This is not Unix. Now imagine you had an SSH-based botnet, bidirectional initiation, client could be talking to the server, server could be reaching out to the client. Once the SSH connection has been created, you have two long-running processes on either end, and they provide you with a Unix socket pair across the SSH tunnel. Add some sort of inventory. I wrote read class, I would use that. There are others. And then I think the rest is easy. And I'm gonna end my short presentation with a call to your imagination. You have a socket pair. It's an encrypted con connection between your central machine and your host. You could have little bouncers in between to scale it. You have a socket pair, long-running processes, do remote execution, policy enforcement, monitoring, data collection, triggers, do whatever you want. I want to see this soon. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Antonio, he's going to be talking about Nosfero. Hello. Uh, so Nosfero started in the context of a solidarity economy company, so I, I created a company with my colleagues to work in the solidarity economy uh, context, which basically means that resources and goods are a means to people and not the other way around. And then if you want to create a network of people who think like that, you can't be doing because uh, you can't be doing that because uh, the proprietary social networking providers treat people like things. So if you're using a proprietary software ne social network, you're not a cons customer, you are the product. So that's clearly a contradiction. So if you know anything about programming or even elementary school math. So we, we need free social networking alternatives. So uh, Nosfero is one of those platforms that provide such as a social networking platform. It's not federated yet, but we'll get there. There's a bunch of people already using it, so Bogosphere is a, 
network of bloggers who are in Brazil concerned about freedom of speech and not being censored by politicians or whoever else. Cirandas is a network of uh, solidarity economy enterprises. More than 20,000 enterprises are there. Not all of them are using the network yet, but uh, they were uh, they were registered there by uh, data from a census of uh, those enterprises in Brazil. Curso uh, Rea is an educational uh, uh, network. Escambo is people related to the solidarity economy movement that do. Escambo um, uh, is uh, trading goods without money involved. I don't remember the word in English for that now. Do we have. Sorry? Barter. Barter? Okay. Uh, you have the Brazilian Pirate Party. You have uh, Ripe, which is a educational platform from the uh, University of Bahia. Softlivery.org, which is the main uh, countrywide uh, free software community in Brazil. There's the uh, University of Sao Paulo, which is the biggest university in the country. It's using that for. Uh, that integrated Moodle for uh, educational purposes and also uh, Catholic University of Salvador, also using that starting now. So all those, uh, then there's a bunch of others, so there's an initiative by the federal government to uh, invite the society to participate in government decisions and policies. So there's the .br one is offline right now because of the uh, presidential elections, so you are to make sure <laughs> nothing regarding the elections go up there. But there is a, they are creating a government-specific website to deal with uh, uh, collaboration inside the government. There is also University of Brasilia, both the soft engineering school and the IT center are using it. And outside of Brazil, there are a couple of experiences. People of the Technical University of Dresden uh, did uh, some experience there. And also there's people in Japan using it. And all those people are either contributing back to the community or paying some, someone to do it. So if you want to do it, you have to deal with those kind of things. But you probably don't need to worry much because it's all packaged for Debian. It's not in Debian proper yet, but it will be at some point. So if you go there, you have the 1.0 RC1 release available for Wizzy. And you can collaborate with us. You can find us on GitLab. So GitLab.com is a free software alternative to GitHub, which you can use their service or you can install in-house. And then there's a, in the website, there's a bunch of document, development documentation if you want to do it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Anyone? 35 oh, seconds. The license is AGPL v3, if uh, you're wondering. Have you heard of IndieAuth as a method for uh, federating simply between different websites? What's that? Uh, IndieAuth? I think it's. Okay. No. I haven't yet. So the idea is to use the protocols that other uh, social networks are using to federate, so we're not reinventing any wheel. Thank you very much. Next up is Josh Triplett, who will be talking to us about deconf and a Git home directory. Go. All right, so. Ah, good call. Uh, this works. So I keep my home directory in Git. Well, meh, that's not really all that interesting these days. On the other hand, I used to run GNOME 2, and GNOME 2 uses gconf. So I wanted to track this in my git home directory. So it turns out, if you create a file .gconf.path, tell it, oh, I have this other gconf directory, then it'll keep a second store of gconf data with a big steaming pile of XML. So I could track that in Git, okay, more or less worked. I could track some of the settings that I cared about. It wasn't perfect, it's a little difficult to actually edit. You have to go edit the XML file by hand because it's read-only to gconf, but it worked. And of course you had to restart to actually apply any changes. You pretty much had to log out and back in. So now I run GNOME 3, and GNOME 3 uses dconf. 
So there is no uh, deconf.path or similar for users to use. There's all sorts of stuff that root can use for system administration, but that would mean I'd have to put all my uh, configuration in Etsy and not in my get home directory. So that's obnoxious. What I want is to keep it all in my home directory. So other problem with deconf is everything's a big binary database file. It's not text. So, you know, as if XML wasn't bad enough. So it's binary. It does have some nice advantages. It's really fast. You don't have to go talk to a central service to read it. But how the heck do I deal with this in yet? Ugh. So instead, I drop by the IRC channel for deconf. And the author of deconf, Ryan Lordy, is really awesome. So deconf now has stacked user databases where you can put several of them together. And it has user profile support without having to set it up in, as root in Etsy. So I, put a bun I created a bunch of scripts to manage this in my get home directory. In particular, I set a deconf profile. And in that, I can say, well, I have this user database, and I also have this key file database. And a key file is just a really simple text file with key value pairs. Well, that's really nice. So I have another profile that I can use to edit things with that just says the key file is read-write. And I have a little editable script, deconf e, to run something to edit my database. It runs with a different profile. So that means I can go run G settings or similar under deconf e, and it will edit those settings. But it also means I can run any program I like under deconf e, like the GNOME Control Center, and graphically change my settings, and they show up in that file. So I also want to figure out, well, what the heck am I doing with this? How do I commit this? Well, I created a deconf diff script, deconf d. Wrote that in Python. I'm not going to be showing all of that on the slides. But it gives you output like this. Oh, I changed my background color because I'm feeling boring, so now I have a basic black background. So I get a diff. It's, a basic, it's actually a diff format, so I can run it through color diff. I, uh, can then copy that with another script, get that out of the main deconf database that I use for random junk the desktop uses and throw it into my uh, uh, key value pairs. I uh, can then commit that. And uh, I can, uh, now the other problem with that is there's a lot of junk in deconf. Not completely worthless, but you know, here's where my window is for GU care map and is it maximized and what was the last character I looked at. I don't want to check that into get every time that I've used GU care map. So I also created an ignore file for the diff utility. So let's make sure I only check in the things I care about. The other really awesome thing is deconf uses inotify. So it will actually see changes I make to that key value store immediately. If I go edit that text file, change my background color, my desktop will crossfade over to the new color instantly without me doing anything. If you'd like to check all of that out, you can clone my home directory from my home page. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Next person up is Hideki. To this one? Yeah, you can do that, or you can use the spacebar. Space bar. Hello. <laughs> Go. Go. Yeah. Uh, I'm Hideki Yamane from Japan, and uh, this is my second talk in DevCon. <laughs> Uh, today, I want to talk about the Debian specific issue, not technical one and not general one. Uh, there's a lot of things among the Debian project and uh, we are dealing with uh, that issue, but probably we need more contributors. And uh, how do we get more contributors? Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I should... the find the bottleneck of the Debian project and fix it, then the most of the uh, issues will be gone, in my point of view. So in this session, I want to share, j just share my idea and uh, get the feedback uh, later. Uh, one, uh, in my point of view, the new queue is a kind of bottleneck. The all packages should be reviewed by FTP masters uh, to get into the repository, and also the FTP master should whole package. Then 
accept or reject it. It takes many days, uh, probably three or two, uh, three, two, four, mm, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it has wrong assumptions. Uh, not, uh, it's only FTP masters and the whole package. But if the, some reliable contributors can check it before the FTP masters do, it's, in my point of view, it's enough there. So we contributors help the FTP masters. Uh, my idea is kind of this, the add a preprocessor for NUQ. Uh, preprocessor means the review by contributors. Then uh, they can reject the obvious fault earlier, the improve the upload, check, and reject and fix and the re-upload the process. Uh, it also means from the serial process to parallel process, we can do some things parallel. And uh, we are the kind of the multi-core monster machine, the thousand core machine. Like this. <laughs> and also the kind of the, uh, the Contributors mean the kind of buffer cache. The, so we can uh, uh, do the stable output to, for the new packages. Okay, the, then what, what the FTP master should do, just, I, I just collect the reviews, for, uh, reviews from contributors and say go and no go <laughs> to the up uploaders and the contributors. And it may be better to share the, this how-to. And I just guess the reason why they restrict to, restrict to only FTP masters, probably the, the legal risk. But uh, we don't do the distribution, but how about use G, GPG encryption for the, for the, the share the source with the contributors, it, it, it will work. So if we do it, uh, then probably the unstable uh, will be more attractive one for developers. We can, uh, you can get any software. Then uh, contributors will be the future FTP masters or assistants. And we can uh, measure the success, the daily statistics, and the average days. So uh, I just want to share this, my idea, and discuss uh, later in the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hideki. Next up is Francois, who's going to tell us how not to delete our important files. Yeah, just next. Go. All right. So, how not to delete your important files? If you uh, so, the, basically, the whole talk is about to, is, is trying to convince you to do this. If you do this now, you can stop paying attention and go to sleep. But let me start with a little story. Now, I was trying to do this one day, clean out some junk from my uh, user lib directory, but uh, running as root, of course. Uh, but when I ran this command. I hit a little bit of a weird error message. <laughs> and I didn't really understand why I was trying to delete slash junk. That's kind of not the directory I asked for. Until I realized that I had made a very small typo. There's a bit of an extra space here. So <clears throat> I hit control C as soon as I realized that. But half of my user lib was gone. And that was kind of sucky. <laughs> Now, um, in order to recover from this, I followed a simple five-step process. The first one was a little, involved a little bit of swearing. Then I had to reinstall the package by uh, looking at a different machine and actually copying individual files from it, because of course I didn't have the package to, to install the dev. Um, then I had to reinstall apt. And of course I had to do all the dependency stuff myself because apt is the thing that does dependency management in Debian, right? So I had to reinstall everything that app depended on, all the libraries that those libraries depended on using the package. 
Finally, I was able to get the uh, list of installed packages on my box because I hadn't wiped slash var. So that was good. And I just had basically a loop that was going through all the packages and doing apt get reinstall of all of them. Um, all in all, I think it took me about half a day to just figure out how to do this and just go through it and do it. Uh, I didn't lose anything, that was great. But I thought, wow, that was such a big waste of time for you know a, a little white space error. Um, so I thought, well, there's a couple of directories on my machine that if I try to delete, if I, if I ask RM to delete those, it makes absolutely no sense for me to, to want to do this. Like, I can't find a good reason for me to want to delete user bin or user lib or something like that. So I said, okay, I'm going to write a little tool, and I called it safeRM. And basically, what it is, is that it's a wrapper that installs it around the RM command, and it installs itself inside a user bin. RM. So the real RM is in slash bin, and user bin is before slash bin in the path. So if you type RM after installing safe RM, you're going to get the wrapper. If you do want to delete your user lib, you can always do that like this um, <laughs> after you install safe RM. But normally, if you try to do this, what you'll get instead is just an, a message that says that it skipped that file. Hey! Um, th those are the directories that are uh, in the blacklist by default, so basically system stuff. You can configure that at the system level by adding directories to the first file, or you can also add it uh, on a per user uh, basis. So I'm going to install SafeRM now before you actually need it. <laughs> Thank you. We don't have very much time. Ask him. Okay, next up is Zach. We have precisely six minutes left, so you can use five of those or you can hurry up. My data after that? Yes. Okay. So, known free. Uh, we do this very cool, entirely free operating system, which is called Debian, but it's. Sorry? Okay, and you think people are. Okay, cool. So, we do this very interesting and absolutely free operating system called Debian, except it's actually called Debian Main, right? So, um, this is kind of interesting, but we also do support other stuff, which is content non free, because there are people that are in need of non free bits to make their computer work, like this laptop, like my laptop down there. And that's kind of cool, because we are actually allowing people to use some free stuff that they would not be able to use otherwise. But there is a kind of a very big difference between the first word in that sources is line, main, and the second word and the third word. Essentially, when people cross that line, when they enable content on free, they kind of lose kind of a good feature that we, we can offer them. It's not only about politics. It's that we cannot support content on free as properly as we do support main. People that use stuff in main are people that can can come to us, you can have a look at the source code of what they are doing, help them out, and so on and so forth. So I've been proposing for quite a while this kind of a mental approach to the distinction between uh, free and non-free software, which is what I call the big red line. So essentially we should take as an opportunity the distinction among the two to explain to people why free software is good for them. So just show them a big red line saying you are free to do what you want, you are free to use free software or non-free software, that's fine, it's your choice, but beware that when you cross that line, well, you will be giving up some freedom for the people that are into free software politics, but you will also be giving up some good features which, you, which we can offer you, like support and the ability to help you, and so on and so forth. Well, except that there is a problem. For non-technical people, for someone that are not, that, for people that are not that into Debian details, it's not that easy to realize that if they only have the word main in the sources list, they're only using Debian, they're only using free software, whereas if they had added one of those two words, they might be using other stuff, which is not Debian, right? So a few months back, I think actually one year later, one year ago exactly at DevConf, I went up and registered this nonfree.org website, which is essentially a domain you can use in your sources list files, exactly as if it were a Debian mirror, except it will only serve contrib and non-free. So you can have a sources list file, which is essentially two line. The first line is the usual line pointing to your favorite Debian mirror, or maybe using some uh, HTTP redirector like HTTP Debian net, and use only main for that line. And have another line in which you use http.nonfree.org, which will be using the same redirector which is being used by HTTP 
the net, but will only serve content and non-free. The advantage here is mostly communication. So people, when having a look at sources.list file, will see that there is stuff which comes from Debian, which is only free software, and there is stuff which is not coming from Debian, and most likely is non-free software. So that's it. Uh, if you are interested, please try to use this. I've been using it for the past six months on my laptop without an issue. I want, to, I want to check how many people are interested in using this. If you think it's something that would help our communication to people of, of what is free and what is non-free, please document it in a wiki or in, the, in your favorite Debian documentation, and we'll see how much traction it gets. Before leaving, many thanks to Rafael Geisert, which helped me setting up the uh, non-free redirector for nonfree.org, and it works out of the box, we'll find the right mirror, and so on and so forth. Thanks a lot. Exactly. Next up, Vagar and Cascadian. How do we start up the screen message? Yes. Um, hi, I'm here. Uh, I'm Vagar and Cascadian, and uh, I maintain some packages that I don't fully understand. Um, how many of you in here maybe uh, do the same? Right? Surprise. Um, so how do I do this? Well, well, uh, I got involved in uh, the Debian Edu project for a while. Um, and they had a big, long list of bugs, mess loads of bugs. So I went through, and I fixed the ones that didn't seem so hard. Um, that was great. And uh, years later, I basically dropped out of the scene, and I didn't really work with Debian Edu at all. Um, then I got involved in Kimu because, well, I wanted to do these cross-architecture to root things, and uh, Ubuntu had this static Kimu builds and stuff like that, and there had been bug reports sitting around in the archive for ages. And so I went ahead and kind of tried to piece together stuff I didn't really understand. And uh, the maintainer said, oh, great, you want to work on Kimu. Two years later, I was the only person doing uploads. Um, and then, thankfully, I passed that off to somebody who actually seems to know what they're doing. Um, another project I got involved with, uh, well, Let's see here. Um, very recently, I picked up Git Remote BZR. I don't really understand what that does. Uh, I understand what it does for me. <laughs> and I understand what it does for you. I don't really understand how it works. But uh, I try. And um, how do I make this successful? Uh, I use my social skills. I talk to other people who do know what this does and I get them to help me. And if I'm really lucky, I get them to take over. Um, so that's one of the things I do. Uh, so I've made some project limp along a little bit longer than maybe they should. Maybe it made it look like there was a maintainer where there shouldn't be. Um, but uh, that also meant that Kimu was in the archives still after years. Some people found that useful. One of my recent acquisitions is U-Boot. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, as many of these things go, I was like, hey, could you enable U-Boot support for this board? And they're like, sure, you can do it. Uh, thanks, Clint. Um, so I've since enabled like four or more things for U-Boot, and I've fixed some bugs. And uh, just the other day, I reported a bug on it and things like that. And uh, it's been kind of successful, and even uh, people hand me hardware now and say, could you make U-Boot work on it? I say, I'll try. <laughs> um, but uh, as with many projects in Debian, uh, uh, U-Boot could use some help, uh, especially with testing on specific boards. Um, Packages I do know how to maintain are LTSP, uh, Linux Terminal Server Project. It's a thin client implementation. You boot computers over the network. It's all cool and stuff. I'm uh, one of the only remaining upstream developers on that. Um, but uh, And another one I maintain successfully is Simple CDD, which I, uh, well, I understand simple CDD, but it wraps around all these things I don't understand, like Debian CD, Debian installer. It like pieces them all together, and I don't really understand it. But uh, through brute force attempts, sometimes I actually get something that works. And actually, I have barely had to maintain this at all over the years. I just usually do one upload shortly before the release, just to keep compatibility with the current stuff. 
Um, so I encourage you to go outside of your comfort zone. Uh, when offered to work on something that you're like, that's way over my head, um, just do what you can. Uh, because uh, otherwise, that might not get done. And you can do some things. Uh, so that's about it. Thank you very much, Vagrant. Um, so we're getting dangerously close to the next talk, but we have one more speaker left. Lucas, I think you should try it until they kick you off. And while you're coming up here, I would like to say thank you very much, video team. This is stressful stuff. You're covering it. Good work. So one minute, right? <laughs> yeah, you have 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So I want you to talk about three things. First one was, well, basically, uh, try to answer a really difficult question that people get to ask you all the time. It says, how can I contribute to Debian? Because we are a great community, people would like to join, but it's quite hard to join. So three ways, uh, well, three main points in this to answer that. First one is, how can I help? So Okana App is a package that uh, lists opportunities for contributions. If you install it, it just runs after each apt-get command. So it gives an output like that with uh, orphan packages, gift bugs, uh, packages that are removed from testings and you have installed locally. Well, for all of them, there are about packages that are installed locally, so are probably packages you care about. You can also feed it with a list of packages that you care about that are not installed locally. So that's a good way actually to monitor packages you maintain uh, and that might be uh, removed from testing or going to be removed from testing. Second thing is how to learn to package. So there's a pretty nice tutorial uh, that apparently works, but people have been using it. Uh, they have uh, 80 slides, that's about six hours of teaching if you want to do a live tutorial. Uh, there are practical, practical sessions for Java, Perl, Ruby, and soon probably your own team. Uh, it's available in English, Spanish, French, Japanese, and Portuguese, and probably your own language soon. Uh, contributions are welcomed. And the third thing I wanted to mention is that, well, we all know that uh, Debian Mentor doesn't work so well. Um, it's much better to direct people to teams. There's a big list of teams uh, on the wiki, uh, 139 teams. Uh, it's a good idea to check if yours is listed and if uh, the description for your team is still up to date and if uh, there are tasks that are suitable for new contributors. Um, experience shows that uh, if your team is properly documented, it works, and people just show up and uh, start helping. Thank you. So thank you to the 15 Lightning Talk speakers. Let's give them another hand of applause. And I guess uh, the release team is up next.